Okay, good evening everybody here in the British Library. Very nice to see you. Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, to all those of you watching online, thank you again. Hi, my name is John Fawcett. I look after the events programme for the British Library. So tonight is one of our events in conjunction with our new exhibition, Animals, Art, Science and Sound, which is open uh, over in the main building in the Packard Gallery. Uh, and it's running until the end of the summer. Um, and we're very proud of this exhibition. It's getting some lovely reviews. And it's, uh, it's using... Um, art, it's using imagery, it's using manuscripts, it's using sound recordings to show all the different ways that humans have documented and talked about animals over many centuries. And it ranges from all kinds of things, from the first scientific description of a platypus, which was once thought so bizarre that it must be a hoax, uh, or a drawing of a monkfish that looks actually like a monk. Uh, you can hear how the, one of the very last uh, recordings made of a now extinct bird to uh, high definition photography of insects that reveal their colours and their beauty like never before. So it's very varied, very rich exhibition, so please do have a look. We have a very busy events programme accompanying the exhibition also, so please do have a look online at that. Uh, tonight's event, Wildlife Conservation Now, uh, we're delighted to welcome a really excellent panel here. We have Craig Bennett, Chief Executive of the Wildlife Trusts. We have Becky Spade, uh, there, uh, Chief Executive of the Royal Society of Protection of Birds. Andrew Terry, uh, Director of Conservation at ZSL, all in conversation with our chair tonight, Justin Rowlatt, climate editor at the BBC. Uh, the event is also a little nod to the imminent coronation of His Majesty King Charles III, uh, someone who's made awareness of the importance of nature conservation one of his most passionate priorities through his whole life. So thank you very much for being here once again, and over to Justin and the team. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Cheers, John. Thank you. Um, so we've introduced our panel. I could go into a bit more detail about your back, shall we? I mean, I mean no, let's not. I mean, <laughs> you know who they are, and if we need to fill in a bit more. But Craig, Craig before this, was uh, CEO of Friends of the Earth. Um, Andrew, you've worked for quite a long time at ZSL, haven't you? Uh, four years. Oh, it's not that long. Not uh, that long. Before that, newbie. head of conservation programmes of UK development at Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. Yeah, saving species in weird places. Yeah, okay. We'll weird talk species about some... in great places. We'll right. talk, talk about that later. Becky has been, before that you ran the Woodland, Woodland Trust and prior to that you were at National Trust. Lots of trusts in your background, lots of trust. Um, but let's, let's start off with the exhibition. Has everybody here seen it? Have you been? I mean, I'd like to just, I mean, if any, I mean, speak up. What did you think of it? What did you see? What, what exhibits particularly caught your attention? Becky, you start. Uh, well, I just, I mean, I nipped in literally yeah. this afternoon. And I mean, a couple of things struck me. The first was the soundscape. Mm. Right? That soundscape is just amazing. If you haven't been, you'll love it. And I think it, the thing that really struck me about it was um, I'm, I'm waking up every morning at the moment because of the dawn chorus, and I kind of ha I have to have my window open to hear it, whatever the temperature. <laughs> I have to hear it because it's that time of year when you really hear it. And just going in and hearing that soundscape, and I loved hearing the curlew towards the end was absolutely gorgeous. And the other thing that really struck me was some of those amazing artefacts, which I guess are from the collection mainly here. Yeah. Um, and there was a, a huge, there's a huge plate from um, um, the Odebon book, which is a very famous kind of bird book. And there's a gorgeous plate of, I think, a barn owl. Um, and it's just stunning, you know. So just the quality of some of the kind of craftsmanship that's gone into those. You see Leonardo, yeah. isn't he? Uh, and you're <laughs> like, that could have been, he could have done it yesterday. Yeah. The quality of the, the colours are just as vivid as they were when he yes, first yeah. did it. Any, I mean, anything else you'd like to pick up on? Any... But you were quite upset by it, weren't you, Craig? Yeah, well, yeah, in some ways. I mean, I thought it's an amazing exhibition. It's really, really incredible. It's, it's so funny when you work on things day to day and then you, you see something that provokes you to really stop and think. And the video footage of the thylacine, the um, a Tasmanian tiger, you know, I found that quite upsetting, really, because it's such a beautiful, beautiful animal. And it's just so sad to think that it's no longer there. Well, it's also so obviously distraught, isn't it? Yes. And we, I mean, obviously, that, we're yeah. kind of, you know, we're yeah. anthropomorphising it by imposing our knowledge mm. that it's the last of its But when kind. it does that big yawn or whatever mm. it does, yeah. you know, it's such an incredible mouth. And it's so sort of uh, similar and yet clearly yeah. very different from my Labrador, so... <laughs> yeah. And you just sort of think, uh, how sad that it's not there anymore. So... And it just, it just provoked me to stop and think. But then the, the flip side of it, I found myself, you know, the, um, 
the, the songs of birds, the, the records from yeah. the 1930s. I found that amazing. And Although actually, there is the last cry of that Hawaiian yeah. bird, yeah. which again is really yeah. poignant. I mean, if you haven't seen it, do go, because it's really full of amazing stuff. What about you, Andrew? Did you? So, I mean, for me, I, I love the, the meeting of art and science. And you see that in many different ways. You see earlier stuff that's more art than science, and you see some other bits that are more. But science it's kind of an art. aspiration but to understand, isn't it? There's exactly kind of that, and and um, you know the Audubon. But I mean that's the Holy Grail, and and for me, I've I've got a print on the wall at home. Uh, but to see an actual Audubon and the original there are five, the, I mean, is, in the world. It's, uh, oh, there are there any five? Are there any of those five? elephant editions, yeah, of the elephant. Oh, wow. I mean, so you're looking at one of the most valuable and most important uh, ornithological books in the world ever. And it's just, uh, so a bit of hero worship at that point. There's also an original copy of the f a first edition of Linnaeus's, you know, categorization yeah, of the species, which again is pretty extraordinary, isn't it? And again, I think my wife works here, I should, you know, <laughs> kind of be honest. And she said, I said, and, you know, is it from your, and she went, oh yeah, we got loads of, loads. We got, <laughs> you know, we could do exhibitions on anything. Anyway, let's cut to the chase because we're here to talk about biodiversity. We're also here a little bit to talk about the role of the new king in kind of what, what can he do to help us with this effort to um, tackle this huge problem we have of biodiversity loss. And I first, we're going to start with the depressing stuff first. Andrew, yes. your head of conservation at ZSL, Zool Zoological Society of London. Um, one of the things that ZSL does is it, it has a kind of keeps a kind of, does a, uh, an estimate of, of kind of species at risk. So where do we stand at the moment? Well, and so yeah, I mean, we, we develop a tool called the Living Planet Index. And that's a way of, of bringing together lots and lots of data on populations of animals that are monitored around the world, and looks at changes in those populations over time. And what that tells us is that over the last 50 years, monitor populations have declined by 69%. So if you look back over the last 50 years and think about how economies have developed, how things have developed, how, how uh, things have grown, it's all come at the cost of the natural world. And this is one indicator amongst a suite of indicators that look at the changing state of nature around us. And as a barometer, like a, a FTSE indicator for, for life, it's showing that it's in really bad state. And wherever we look, we see that that is a global trend. And it's not uniform across the world. So if you look into Northern Hemisphere context, the US and, and Europe, that's more historical. We did the damage earlier on, so we're kind of bottoming out. And in some places, we see recovery starting to happen. It's most extreme in Latin America at the moment, and then Africa, uh, where it's really declining. And also, um, when we look into freshwater and marine ecosystems, it's really plummeting. And, and you think, you know, that water is the vital resource of all life, and, and it's the, the, the ecosystem that's getting hammered the worst. And it's interesting because people talk about, you know, the threat from climate change is, you know, we, I mean, I'm a climate editor, we talk, I talk about it all the time, but the biodiversity challenge is actually more immediate and, and kind of it, 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 at the moment is deeper. Climate change is a future threat and obviously it's getting worse and worse, but the drivers of the destruction of biodiversity are operating right now and yeah. are destroying biodiversity on a scale that we haven't really seen. It's yeah, so if you look at the signals of what's causing those losses, Climate in of itself is actually quite small at this stage because we're kind of looking at what mm. we're dealing with. But we are, we are you know, very aware of what climate change is doing and it, and it is very quickly becoming the dominant driver of change alongside traditional sort of resource extraction, habitat loss, over-exploitation, those, those uh, kind of real sort of drivers of, of loss in, in, in the natural world. Uh, climate is interacting with those to, to make the situation uh, far worse. So we expect it, it's becoming the dominant driver of change. And Becky, let's talk about, because one of the things the RSPB does that you probably do know about is actually the biggest citizen science project in the world, your big garden bird watch. So which is a way, obviously, of taking stock of the species of birds that we see all around us. What does that tell us? If, I mean, if you can remember, but what does that tell us yeah. about the trajectory of our, I mean, most, I mean, obviously it's garden bird watch, so it's garden birds. Yeah. So it's interesting. So, you know, when, you, when you're talking about species, you've obviously got, you want to stop species going extinct, right? 
I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, you want to stop species becoming rarer as well, and you want to keep our common species common. So that kind of sense of abundance, so that you know when you when you look out of your window, if you're lucky enough to have sparrows, you see loads of sparrows. You know, and so it's that abundance thing, and I think that's where big garden bird watch really plays in as an exercise because it looks at some of our most common birds the ones that people see in their back gardens in their local park you know on their balcony and it just gets everybody to say right you know how many am i seeing um, at any one time at a specific time and and kind of you know and, and what does that tell us overall and what does that tell us over time um, so you do get these kind of, you get the kind of, you know, <laughs> I'm always having to go on radio too and they do a kind of countdown, but you get to see, you know, which birds are doing really well, which birds are doing less well, but the overall story is often one of decline. So even though this year, I think the sparrow came top yet again, but actually sparrow numbers have declined over time. So that's what it tells you. And it kind of tells you, and it, it, it's, it's been quite useful as well in sort of, um, pointing out some of the early problems so I think it was the it was the big garden bird watch exercise that kind of said you know what we've got a problem with song thrushes people are seeing far fewer song thrushes in their gardens and, and it kind of pointed out that sort of um, that sort of um, problem early but um, it, it's it's a really interesting exercise because it's not it's not kind of it's not kind of absolute kind of perfect evidence in that sense but when you combine it with lots of other evidence you get you get the whole picture mm. and that's that's what's important can we do a little kind of slight corner turn because we you know, this is advertised as being about the king as well. So I'm going to turn to you, Craig, who runs the uh, Wildlife Trust. But, you know, over the course of your career, you've had quite a lot of dealings. In fact, you ran one of uh, then Prince Charles's uh, charitable organisations. Tell us a bit about your involvement with the now king. And, uh, and then let's talk a bit about his role in kind of raising awareness of some of the issues that we've talked about. Yeah, so I worked closely with him when uh, I was director of what was then called the Prince of Wales Corporate Leaders Group on Climate Change. This was about 10, 15 years ago um, and was run out of the University of Cambridge, uh, the Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And, and also in my, in my current job as uh, Chief Executive of the Wildlife Trust, he's also been our patron one way or another since the early 1970s. And I think uh, that's the thing to really emphasise here is that You've got to bear in mind, his first environmental speech was in the late 1960s. So way before it was trendy to do so. Mm. Um, and I mean, almost like whatever you think about the monarchy and, and anything like that, the fact is he has authentically cared passionately about these issues for the whole of his life. And in the face of ridicule on occasion. In the face of ridicule for most of his life. Yeah, that's true. Know? and probably with quite a lot of pushback from institutions around him as well. Um, so it's absolutely authentic with him. And also what's been authentic with him is, is what you might call, what we would now call perhaps our, his system level understanding. So looking at it as all kind of interconnected. Um, and actually he's been uh, enormously successful at kind of preempting what future concerns will be. So you know, whether it's, you know, deeply concerned about plastics long before the rest of the world was talking about plastics or... River actually, pollution, his first speech. Sorry? His, spit that air speech. pollution, yeah. Air well, pollution. river pollution back in a the river 60s. Pollution. Was, yeah, he's, he was so, talking about the impacts of air pollution on health. Um, I mean, I did, a, I did a media interview um, around the time of the Queen's funeral about this and, and um, I look back and his first ever environmental speech talked about, yes, you're right, river pollution. And that week, everyone was talking about river pollution and, um, and also air pollution, but specifically the impact of air pollution on people's health. And it was that week, uh, just before the, the Queen's funeral, that a new study had come out absolutely nailing once and for all the, the impacts of air pollution on people's health. So he's, uh, he's really quite prescient in a lot of the stuff he's done on this. But his real role in this has been convening. It's just been, it's been to uh, bring the right groups of people together to have the right conversations, often the right places, to try and uh, break through and, and, and make change happen. So um, it is, it, the, the big thing is just, no one can take away how authentic it's been for him. And, but it's, 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 it's quite interesting that you talk about convening because one of the things that was very clear when he became king was he said this is a different role and he, you know, it certainly looked to 
people like me who were watching to see how strong he'd be on this issue, that he was saying, listen, I can't play the role that I used to play. Obviously, I can't be as outspoken, yeah. you know, as a, as a monarch. I, you know, I'm kind of impartial and stand, sit above or aside or wherever he'd want to place himself. Um, but that convening role is quite interesting because that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to kind of state a strong opi opinion. Yeah. Can you I see mean, him convene? Is he, is he convening now? Is he still doing that, bringing people together and trying to affect change? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he will do. I think probably in this first year he's been a bit cautious. But, um, but what I would say is, uh, you know, we, we have a certain image that we... That, that there's a narrative has developed about saying that the monarchy doesn't get involved in, in some of these issues and so on. But it has. It always has done. I mean, uh, you know, the Queen, for example, we, should, we forget now, perhaps, even a year later, a year or so later, um, the Queen sent a message, a video message to COP26 saying the time for talking is over, you know, bash your heads together and sort something out. She didn't quite use those words, but something like that. Um, so um, the, the, the monarchy has done that over time. And I thought it was kind of quite interesting, actually, um, Princess Royal's message this morning uh, to Canadian media about the long term and again irrespective of whatever you think about the monarchy i think what's interesting is they do think their to an extent their role is to think about the issues that actually don't work very well in short-term electoral cycles and so i think for quite a long time actually uh the prince of wales now the king and his uh, office have felt fairly comfortable on this as an issue that isn't always served brilliantly by short-term electoral cycles and is actually all about, you know, worrying about the long term. And if there's one role for a monarchy, if you have it, it's to, it's to think about that. There was one moment where we saw the king actually quite deliberately as king doing a kind of environmental event. And do you remember Liz Truss said to him he wasn't allowed to go to COP27, the Egyptian uh, uh, climate conference? Probably wasn't quite expressed as clearly as I'm putting it. And then he convened a meeting of kind of leaders and business leaders, lots of the people who were involved with his activities already at Buckingham Palace in the week before, as everybody was travelling to Egypt. He, John Kerry and people turned up, you know, the climate uh, envoy for uh, President Biden. So he was kind of saying, look, I may not be going, but I'm still kind of active in this. I thought that was quite telling that he just chose to do it. But our other uh, panellists also have close links with the monarchy. I don't know how much, well, you're a royal society. We are. So I think we were discussing which monarch you're, I think you've got the older charter though. ZSL. We're George the Fourth. George yeah, the Fourth, and they're George the Fifth. But obviously, we had like almost a hundred years between those two Georges. But um, I mean, what role? I mean, does the monarch play a role in what the RSPB does, or is it just a title? Uh, the You're queen. the boss. <laughs> so the queen, the queen was our patron, um, uh, and we're kind of at that stage now where we're waiting to see kind of what will happen in terms of royal patronage and many charities oh, might are he's, doing. Might, can 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 you? step away we, we don't know we don't know what's you know. how useful is it having a monarch when you're trying to do the kind of things that you do i think i think it it's it can be incredibly useful so i think in terms of kind of you know we were founded in 1889 so it kind of goes with that sort of sense of a history of um action and activity and over time again it's that kind of that long longevity mm. issue it really brings that it can also be controversial as well you know some people really don't like the fact that we are a royal society so you know it can it can absolutely cut both ways um, but i think my experience of it i mean we used to meet with um then prince charles as the as the queen's sort of representative and it was always a really engaging conversation you know he he absolutely knew his stuff and it was a really really engaging conversation i used to really enjoy it um so you know i think it's it can cut both ways but i think it's brought more benefit than disbenefit for us and what about zsl i mean do you feel that he's an act i mean did you did you i mean I, you, you presume the queen was your yes so the, the monarch the reigning monarch has always been our patron since we were founded um and there's always been that relationship there and, and it's also his broader family. I mean, his sons were, were ard, are ardent conservationists and were very, he and they were very influential in initiatives like United for Wildlife to really tackle the illegal wildlife trade globally. Um, so they were really trying to influence the situation. But going way back, I mean, Prince Philip was our president and was uh, instrumental in the founding of our Institute of Zoology. So they were very closely involved in 
how the society was run and, and, and some of the things it, was, it went on to do. Now, I'm sure some of you will have views on the role of the monarch and all this kind of stuff, and we're hoping that you'll all ask questions. Prepare your questions now. If you've got, it'd be quite interesting to hear if you kind of object, you think it's not necessarily helpful to have a head of state who's a monarch, and you know, talk about the role in this kind of thing. And people watching at home, we're very keen to get your questions too, so please do uh, you know, get in touch and use the... Uh, I don't know how they do it. Do they email us? I don't know how you do it, but it's probably evident from whatever you're using to watch this. Please send us some, uh, some messages. So we've kind of mapped out the kind of begun a sense of the scale of the problem. We've also talked a bit about the role of the monarch. But let's move, move on to talking about how we can begin to tackle the challenge of biodiversity loss, which obviously is a huge subject. And let's start in the UK, and we'll start with you, Craig. There was a really good story, really interesting story, which I don't know how many people here noticed, but there was a quite big gift of money, um, a grant, an award of a grant by Aviva, the insurance company, specifically for what? And why is this so important? And how can it help? Yes, well, we were uh, very pleased to announce in January that the Wildlife Trust were receiving £38 million from the uh, pension fund and insurance company Aviva for restoring temperate rainforests up the western half of the UK. And uh, So just quick, what is a temperate? Temperate rainforest. So a beautiful, beautiful habitat that once you would have found across the western half of the UK. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's basically, we often, historically ecologists have sort of called it ancient uh, wet woodland or ancient oak wet woodland. And you can tell when you're in a... Um, temperate rainforest because you uh, there's lots and lots of mosses and lichens growing on top of each other and I have a colleague that described it as if, if you see plants growing on top of plants on top of plants then the chances are it's a temperate rainforest which is a great way of describing it these are incredibly important habitats and they're found actually you know historically would have been found say on the west coast of North America uh, British Columbia has temperate rainforests uh, here in western part of Europe, even in small bits in, say, Georgia uh, to the, um, in, and if different parts around the world. But incredibly important habitats for us. We've lost nearly all of them. There's less than 1% of our temperate rainforest remaining. And where it is left, it's in the little gullies or valleys that are left. So basically they've been too steep or rocky to farm or plough or anything like that, which is why we've still got the seed banks in them. Um, but we now, what we want to do as the Wildlife Trust now is restore as many temperate rainforests as we can uh, across that range up the western part of the British Isles and actually to get them out the gullies and out into the wider landscape again. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? Well, essentially, it's, um, it's like the three things about, for me, about how we put nature in recovery. Number one, you have to, whatever we're talking about, you have to make more space for nature. So what we're going to be doing here with the help of the money from Aviva is buying up lots of bits of land in the right zones uh, to make more space for this rainforest to spread. It's, secondly, it's restoring the abundance of nature. I mean, Becky was talking about it before, but abundance is so important. You know, as, as a conservation sector, we've talked a lot about species diversity and species extinctions over the last hundred or so years. And rightly so, that's important, but I think we've overall neglected talking about abundance, which is just so important if, for the third thing, you're going to get nature working again. Because actually species abundance, the abundance of species is absolutely crucial to just ecosystem function. In other words, getting nature to do the things, the functions it needs to do. So if we can make more space for these temperate rainforests, if we can restore the abundance of key species, which for example we do through um, a mix of uh, natural regeneration for some of the rain the trees uh, and also some planting as well and helping along the way in some cases with lichens and mosses in, in sm some small little interventions and then actually get the ecosystem processes working again over the next hundred years <laughs> and it is a long-term project we actually hope to have temperate rainforests coming back to the UK. And do you think that's achievable? I think it's absolutely achievable. I mean, there's things to watch in all this, not least climate change. I mean, mm. climate change threatens all of our approaches on, on conservation in this country. We all have to be thinking now about actually how do we do this for a climate that is 1.5, 2 degrees, 2.5, perhaps 3 degrees warmer than now. Um, and so we have to be actually helping nature adapt to the climate change yet to come. Um, we feel pretty confident about the temperate uh, rainforest because actually for the western half of the UK um, 
yes, temperatures will rise a bit, uh, a fair bit, but actually what, we're, what they really need is the water, uh, the rainfall, and that is pretty, we're pretty confident that will be there under most climate projections for the western half of the UK. Not the eastern half of the UK, you know, we expect real severe droughts in the eastern half of the UK, but the western half of the British Isles should be okay for rainfall, uh, even in a much warmer world. Let's come on to the RSPB and Becky, because you also have quite big land holdings, don't you? Um, which I'm not sure everybody is aware of how much land you, you know, own and curate. Um, how much, I mean, how, what are the key issues in terms of, you know, using your estate to kind of help restore or support bird life in the UK? Yeah, so um, we have about 160,000 hectares of land in the UK, and that's split up into about 200 odd nature reserves. And some of those are very specifically about um, looking after particular species and trying to almost, I suppose, hang on to some of them in a, in a kind of an arc, so that in theory, once we get the rest of the rest of the UK sorted out, we've got still got that species kind of um, in existence. Um, so if you think about some of the news recently about kind of booming bitterns, making a bit of a comeback, you know, a lot of that has been about really um, good nature reserve management by ourselves and partners to kind of create the exact right habitat that will mean that that, that, that booming bittern kind of population mm. hangs on. Um, and that's reed bed in, in that case specifically. But then we've also got some much bigger areas um, where um, we're taking a much more kind of, you know, what's called a rewilding approach where we're working with natural processes to restore them. So if you think about places like um, horse water on the edge of the Lake District, for example, it's a big area about to become much bigger thanks to some extra funding that's come through. Um, and that is all about kind of, you know, re-wiggling rivers and kind of getting the whole kind of ecosystem working better again, rather than focusing on specific species and kind of seeing what comes out of that, what comes out of that in terms of species benefit. Um, and then around the world, we do quite a lot of work along flyways, you know, these amazing kind of migratory routes. Actually, I was on, um, I have to tell you this story, it was so exciting. I was on, I was on Lundy um, just a couple of weeks ago, which is um, that island that sits between kind of Devon and Wales. Um, and it's right on the migration path, you know. And so I was literally, I was sat on this cliff top and there were like house martins and swallows just kind of flying around me as they kind of made their way north, 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 you know, on that migratory route in. And so we do a lot of work on, on, on flyways, um, working a lot with um, BirdLife International, which is the kind of um, global um, forum for um, bird conservation organisations, which we helped found about 100 years ago. Um, and and that's, that's kind of really important work and has led us to kind of look after specific places around the world as well. And in fact, one of the things that the, um, the, the king really helped us with um, by just, and, and it was a point I didn't make actually, which is really important, is profile, particularly internationally. So um, there's a place in um, Indonesia that we're involved in called Harapan, which is one of the last existing bits. If you look at what's happened mm. to, um, you know, uh, forest in, in Indonesia, I've got a, a sequence of kind of photos that I hardly dare look at that are all run together and you just see it go, you know, down to these tiny bits that are left. And Harapan is one of those. And certainly when he was then Prince of Wales, the current king was enormously important in raising the profile of what we wanted to do there and creating these new concessions, conservation concessions that have now been rolled out over other parts of Indonesia and have made a real difference in terms of conservation there. So we work internationally as well. Yeah, there's another really good RSPB story about you in Italy going after the kind of, you know, they shoot songbirds and eat them uh, as a delicacy. And they were, you were running an investigation to try and work out yeah, yeah. how that was being organised and stuff. Yeah, and trying to kind of, trying to stop, um, for, for example, there's now a moratorium on turtle dove hunting um, going up through the kind of the West, Western um, Europe, which has been really important in trying to hang on to the turtle dove population, doing lots of work here as well on that. So it's the bird that's declined fastest with 98% of our turtle, dove, turtle doves here in the UK. 98%? So 98%. Mm. So really kind of, you know, like hand-to-hand -hand combat to try and get that sorted out. And I mean, so, I mean, there are, we, and we've heard just from this conversation that there are some positive stories here yeah. in the UK. There was a very positive outcome from the conference in Mon Montreal, wasn't there? The UN Conservation Con uh, Conference, where there was a commitment to try and uh, commit 30% of land and sea to nature by 
I mean, 2030. 2030. Incredibly optimistic. Because we like round numbers. Um, but there was, but it was a, but it was actually well supported internationally, wasn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, the. You look slightly skeptical. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, in part, look. Um, as a global community, we came together, uh, what, 15 years ago and made a similar set of commitments and missed them all. Yeah, there were 20 targets. Right? Yeah, the Aichi targets, and they were all, you know, resolutely missed. So what we have to say is what is different? This isn't, a, you know, it has to be, this is not um, kind of everyone clubbing together and going, right, well, that didn't work, so, you know, let's just come up with some new ones. Um, we have to look at what is different. So yes, there's a new global biodiversity framework. Um, it went down to the wire, sort of, you know, uh, real bartering at four o'clock in the morning sort of job. But it, it's potentially really, really important. So yes, we have a strong commitment around terrestrial sort of and, and marine commitments to 30% to of, of Earth's surfaces. That's borderline enough in reality, um, but it's going to be a huge push to get to that. And, and really starting to dive into the detail of what does that actually mean in practice and, and, and how do we bring that to life? And how do we bring that to life equitably for the people who live there? That's something at ZSL we spend a lot of our time through our global programs working with communities to, to look at how do you manage and how do you protect nature sustainably but equitably as well for the people who rely on it? Because this is something we were discussing. I mean, the problem is that the land is almost always owned by somebody. And often it's being kind of actively used. It's being farmed. Yeah. So there's a, you know, if you want to, if you want to extend rainforest, I talked about, I went last year, I went to Bawindi, which is a rainforest in Uganda where the last mountain gorillas are, or one of the last populations of mountain gorillas, one of the last two. And um, it's a brilliant pocket of really kind of, you know, emerald forest, really amazing forest and really biodiverse. But it's, you know, literally you come to the edge of it and, there's a wall of trees and then there's a you know there's a there's a field and um the i mean actually rainforest does regenerate surprisingly effectively if you've got a big body of rainforest so you could move the farmers out um, in theory and then you could allow the rainforest to grow back and in 20 or even 30 you know it's actually you know 20 years you'd probably see the beginning of quite a good rainforest ecosystem but it does depend on moving people out and people are very worried about that whole issue and rightly so and rightly so. And, and equity in this space is really important. Um, I mean, there, there's a few things to say to that. One, you take your foot off the pressure of nature, you will see it come back in, in, at, at a rapid rate. So we always say, remove the pressures first, protect what's there. But the pressures are almost always people. Uh, the pre um, pressures are almost always people driven. And you said, there's don't go there, but I'm a... going to go there because we were talking about this well, earlier. You want to go there. <laughs> and um, one of the issues in Buindi, was there was an indigenous people in the forest who were moved out forcibly by the Ugandan government in the 90s when it was designated a national park. And they're called now the Batwa. They used to be known as uh, pygmies. But they've now been moved and live in, frankly, quite bad conditions. In they do have, they were given land, but not particularly good land. And they live in these communities. Mm. But the population has grown a great deal. And had they stayed in the forest, it's hard to see how the forest could have kept being as pristine as it is now. I did a similar story when I was, I was a correspondent in India. We did something in, uh, in Assam where there's a, a... Beautiful part of the country. Yeah, where there's a huge, really successful rhino park, Kazaranga, and, and uh, well. you know, really successful park with, you know, I mean, a huge population of rhinos in it. It's actually kind of full, as is Bwindi has kind of reached the limit of how many gorillas it can help you you know can sustain um, and again part of that was that the Indian government had a really ruthless which was our story policy of making sure that nobody went into the, into the uh, designated park so it's a there's a really tough balance here there is but we have to be realistic that people are a pressure on these wild spaces and but we have to find a way of softening those barriers, right? Because that's where the conflict comes. And if our, you know, one of our, our goals is really, how do we end the extinction crisis? I mean, I appreciate, you know, it's, yeah, it's good to have a lofty goal sort of thing. But we aim at really, what are the tools we're going to, to end this crisis? But if we want to see populations flourish, coming back to the theme of abundance, which is so important, we're going to encounter more and more situations of conflict with wildlife. That's what we're seeing. So the, the positive stories coming out of India around the recovery of tigers in Nepal, we're incredibly proud of the recovery of tigers in Nepal and things like that. 
but you are seeing more and more conflict with wildlife. And so you're having to develop and work with local communities and governments at what those strategies are going to be for a future where climate is moving things around, it's moving wildlife, it's moving people, it's moving ecosystems, and you're having to look at complex layerings of dynamics as to how to mitigate conflict situations, because otherwise we know what's going to happen. So it, it, that is where a lot of the future of conservation is going to be. But surely there's an argument that may, that, you know, you, I mean, you can buy the farmers out and, you know, off the land somewhere else. I mean... And then expand the park. Otherwise, how are you going to expand the parks? You can't. So you don't think... I mean, you can't have rain, you know... You, you don't think of it as terms of parks with fences around them and the animals are in there and you lot are over there. But if That's you a very go to a place like, you, I mean, virtually any rainforest these days, apart from the really big ones, they, you know, the, the, the only good rainforest left is one that is protected somehow. I mean, there are, you know, there are no wild spaces left. But there are, very, there are many different ways of protecting that. And I think it, it, we, one thing we've got to be very careful on, and, and we don't need to kind of over-labour this one, sorry, but <laughs> is to think about there's only one type of t protection and that's sticking a fence around it. Because actually there's lots of evidence that shows that communities are very, very strong advocates. And most of that is outside of formal protected areas. Yeah, that's certainly true in Uganda. They are really proud of the gorillas and the way that they, they as a nation have rallied around and, and protected gorillas. You were nodding vigorously there. Well, I was just going to say, the, the, um, obviously we've got to protect as much of the pristine nature as we've got left. But even if we did that, if that's all we did, we're screwed. Yeah. You know, the, we've got to get much better at protecting more to the point restoring nature putting nature in recovery in, the, in all the land and actually even the cities that we live and work, yep. you know, in our agriculture. You know, there's a phrase, I've, I'm really exercised at the moment about the phrase that's always said out, uh, the, everyone always says oh, things have got to be in balance, you know, so in this country we talk about food production and nature recovery, we've got, we've got to find a balance. Actually, I've come to decide that's rubbish, you know, because the phrase balance actually d immediately suggests these are opposing forces. Um, and that's entirely wrong. There's no such thing as food security if nature's in decline. So a better word is we've got to integrate. Yep. We've got to integrate our food production and our nature recovery and make sure they work together. And right across this country, you ha now have networks of nature-friendly farmers that are showing how you can produce really good, healthy food uh, through regenerative agriculture in the long term and in a way that's good for nature's recovery. And we've just got completely stuck as a society in thinking it's one or the other, or uh, one bit of land you can, you either have yeah. agriculture and this function. bit over here is- Yeah, but your temperate rainforests could only, they need land. So they they need, can't be, they can't be yeah. ca farming alongside- Well, actually, they, they, they can actually, because where I was last week in the Isle of Man, Manx Wildlife Trust, it, the, bit of, the, the bit of land that it's just bought for restoring temperate rainforest, it will do that. But once that, those trees are a certain height, it wants to put in some herbivores in there. So it wants to put some cattle in there roaming around occasionally because that actually can be used as a conservation tool. And, you know, no, it's not going to be intensive agriculture, but it's still a form of agriculture. So we've kind of got to get this right. We've, we've ended up in this completely bizarre paradigm that suggests over here you do nature, over here you do agriculture or over here we do cities. I mean, again, actually a lot of our wildlife species, not least our invertebrates and our bee species in particular, are in a better state in our cities than in the wider countryside. And that tells you everything about our current farming policy in this country. So, you know, actually our only hope is to integrate these much better, integrate our cities, integrate our agriculture, integrate our productive, uh, our seas. I mean, the same thing is true in the, in the marine environment as well. Yes, we need our core reservoirs, those sites, those really protected areas for nature as, as arcs that we can spread out from. But we've got to focus on protecting and restoring nature much better in the wider countryside, whether here or around the world. So I want to come to you guys in a moment and you at home um, to, uh, to see what questions you've got for the panel. We've talked of lots of things, but before we do that, I want to go to you, Becky, and ask you if you can discern a like tipping point. You know, do you think the public now are recognising that they, you know, nature needs help and are willing to kind of make an effort, put money in, donate resources? You've talked about these generous gifts that you've received and you're expanding parks and, you know, dare I say it, parks, but, you know, the land that you uh, manage. Uh, so, I mean, that, that, that's a positive story. But do you think maybe in 
kind of developed countries like Britain, we've, we recognize that nature is in crisis and are beginning to make the changes we need to make. Is there an optimistic story here? I have to believe there is an optimistic story. That's, that's a no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to believe there is an optimistic story. And, and, and I think I see signs of that, definitely. Um, it's interesting because I think you, you talked about in a developed country, you know, and, and we're actually very disconnected from nature, almost, you know, mm. as, as a result of that. You know, if you go somewhere like the Amazon, you know, the, the population that lives in the Amazon is really connected to the Amazon, you know, and is kind of doing um, amazing work to try and kind of protect that forest and keep it there because it gives them a sustainable livelihood as much as, as, much as being important for some, all the other reasons we people, know. I mean, some people. But, 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 you know, here, I think people are, on the whole, pretty disconnected from nature. But I think what's interesting is, I mean, you know, we've been involved in um, co-producing Wild Isles, this, this BBC series that went out about um, uh, UK wildlife. Um, and that's had amazing viewing figures, you know, an amazing reaction from the public. Um, and, and I think, but I think for a lot of people, it was literally kind of eye opening in terms of the kind of the nature that we have here in the UK and then the state of it, you know, the problems there are with it. So I think, I think in terms of our kind of, you know, mass awareness of what's going on, I think it's just beginning to start. It's very easy to get stuck in our bubble and kind of we're faced with these kind of dreadful stats, you know, every day and to think, well, everybody must know this. Actually, people just don't. So I think that's the kind of almost the first step. And then I think people are, it, you know, we were talking about people, you know, desperately keen to kind of, you were talking about where you've been and people were desperately keen to kind of avoid an area where they knew a bird was nesting. Mm. And, and people absolutely get passionate about that. I think what they can sometimes struggle with more is some of the stuff that we've been talking about, which is the kind of systemic change that needs to happen. Things like our food system globally, which is driving so much of nature's loss now. And I think people struggle struggle to get their heads around that and struggle to kind of make the links between kind of, you know, what they're buying in the supermarket and a kind of a food system that's actually destroying the thing that they've decided they love. So I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the jobs that we have and that I think governments have is to kind of make those links for people and help join the dots so that we can kind of achieve the change we need to achieve because that's, that's the state we're in now where we've got to approach things on that sort of scale. And on that note, I'm just going to quickly go to Andrew because we mm. were talking about this as well, weren't, they? weren't we? And you were saying in polls, people often list environment among the top four uh, priorities for them but when you actually look at their behavior they behave a little they don't kind of honor that their commitment yeah I, th I, I think the issue you know people we all face severe challenges in our lives and we're facing them more now than ever before um, and I think there can be a strong sense of disempowerment that comes along with that so that mm -hmm. there are people can think about some concrete things they can do put, put up a bird box and things like that but then they're thinking oh my gosh how do I deal with Th this global collapse or and, and there's a, there's a, always a, a concern about disempowerment that people just step back but I think the one of the, the really important things for us to always emphasize is we have so much power and as citizens as individuals we have more power than we've ever had in terms of the choices we make when we buy things what we watch on the internet because that's being watched who we follow what we read the voices we the, the opinions we share those are being paid attention to more and more than ever before. And we have real agency in this debate as consumer. I mean, ironically, we come into a highly consumerist society where we're all consuming. And that's the fundamental issue. But that then becomes a bit of a lever of power in, in how where that consumerism is going, how it's being exerted. What are we telling major corporations? And you are seeing it. You are seeing supermarkets change what is on the shelf. You are these these things are coming because they respond big corporations respond very very quickly if they want to and so we we have uh, some levers uh, to enact change and we need to make sure people know that we'll pick up on that later is there any questions here any questions uh, online we've got an online question but it might be nice yeah you at the back there go on hold oh, no, on we wait we need to get the microphone so that people watching at home can hear what you have to say Um, I haven't quite formulated this, but um, 
in a way, thinking has to be a bit like an ecosystem in a way that I think we, we get this sort of soundbite way of dealing with things, a kind of superficial, and we need to really not kind of weave the things together in the way governments work in the way maybe in the BBC I don't know but it, it it's not it's not it's not simple but it's correct I don't I don't I don't quite I don't know if you understand what I'm saying <laughs> do you think that process is happening do you think we're I mean for the way that w w what I'm hearing tonight it's wonderful yes and I think the king is it's not superficial and it's not politic politicians just sort of saying okay we'll do this and and that's, that's, you know, that's, we're dealing with it. And I, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> apologies if it's not very clear. Andrew. Well, no, I, was, I mean, one thing I was going to say to that, which you talk about um, uh, having to really think about the, the, the way in which these things mesh together. I mean, everything, yes, we're, the three of us are kind of, we're, we're sort of talking at a very superficial level, but the... the or a high level or whatever, you know. Um, I uh, didn't mean that as a... <laughs> self um, but the... Whenever conservation strategies are enacted, they are... The, the level of depth and local engagement that, that goes into thinking about how those strategies are made locally relevant to, to communities, to species, to context at that point in time, and how much care goes into that is, is absolutely enormous. So, yes, we try and drag everything up to, like, a very top level, but... I, you know, in each case, you, you're always dealing with a very local, very specific series of actors and stakeholders involved, and, and kind of there's a lot of, of negotiation and discussion that goes into developing that, and that's the only way things are ever successful. What I was thinking is like if you're building a motorway and you say, oh, we're knocking down this ancient forest, we're mm. just going to plant some trees and that's going to be fine. As well, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. No, we like, we like kind of easy... I mean, I, I, the, the example I was thinking of when you were talking, actually, is the current um, issue about rivers, you know, that's going on at the moment. So, um, you know, I think the kind of... The, the really successful campaign in pushing kind of, you know, the quality of our rivers up the agenda has been amazing. Um, but we've ended up in a space where I think a lot of... Um, the media, actually, sorry, just in the sorry. media, yeah, I'm used to it. Uh, and, uh, and 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 politicians have ended up saying, you know, actually, what's what's the kind of what's the kind of political salient target? It's the water companies, and so you know, water companies kind of get it in the neck for sewage releases, and that's absolutely right. But of course, the problem is much more complicated than that. You know, we've got all the issues around kind of agricultural runoff, which is causing huge problems, problem. yeah. big, big problem, you know, and that's driven a lot by kind of our demand for kind of, you know, well, around the Y Valley, it's cheap chicken and, you know, and cheap eggs, you know, and then you've got abstraction, that's a real problem, that's again driven by our use of water, by agriculture use of water, by indus industrial use of water, so it's, it's a much more complex web, mm. and I think, you know, the more we... Of which we're apart. Of which we're apart. So the same Absolutely. thing happens in climate change where everybody criticises oil companies, now I'm not going to defend oil companies, but, w but oil companies companies are in a in a kind of three-way partnership with governments and consumers and we all buy their products and use them and then we go oh bloody oil companies you're so wicked and don't mm. see that we're complicit in the whole thing and we're just complicit in the water companies activities in a sense as yeah. well and as customers you know we you know as Andrew says we can express our displeasure I will come to you in a moment Andrew, well that and that was one of the the challenges with the, the process in Montreal because we all agreed on it 30 by 30 in these targets but actually when we come to debate subsidies and, and things like that that was somewhat quietly glossed over but the saving climate yeah exactly and and yeah taking that on and solving that particular problem would be transformational give us your figure for I'm sorry, I will come to you, Craig. Uh, you had a figure for how much money? Oh, the funding gap. But yeah. for, for the, so, how, you know, the bill for solving the problem uh, is about 750 billion, I think, is the sort of... Uh, I suspect that's probably quite modest. So where is that money going to come from, Craig? It's yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. What, what's behind your question? Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is how, as society, to make sense of things, we compartmentalise yeah. these yeah. issues. And yet they're all inextricably linked. And you can't really hope to to address any of them unless you have that system level understanding. My goodness, we even do it in the environmental community. I mean, it's driven me mad for my career that often we talk about the, uh, the biodiversity and ecological crisis as a separate thing from the climate crisis. Yeah. And the two are inextricably linked. You know, we have no hope 
of solving the climate crisis unless we address the biodiversity crisis. We have no hope of solving the biodiversity crisis unless we address the climate crisis. In fact, it's obvious right in front of us by the words we use. You know, we know that to solve the climate crisis, we're going to stop burning fossil fuels. How often do people stop and think that fossil fuels are actually dead biodiversity? You know, it's, it's biodiversity that millions of years ago sucked carbon out the air, then died, and then it was squished down, and now we put it in our cars. And, and we often forget that, you know, and right in front of us uh, is that link between the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. And yet, very often, in probably in all our organisations, in NGOs, the environmental community, you have a bunch of people over there specialising in climate, and a bunch of people over here specialising on biodiversity or even journalists as well justin you know it's just oh, i'm actually the environment editor yeah, which is very both, good yeah. this is very good no, but they do but they want to silo you i but mean you i said i point. should be i said climate's a sub subdivision of environment you should make me environment editor. Exactly. and they wanted me to be a climate editor because the bbc wanted to show its commitment to the issue which obviously is laudable and a good thing but i did feel that it kind of you know neglects kind of but your point, we do have we've a got a joint team of up. environment correspondents. Though, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. So you had a question, and I will come to you. I know you've got one as well. Hi. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, okay, yeah, you, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Craig's actually answered this question for me on a podcast a few weeks ago, but... Um, <laughs> um, See if he says the same thing again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> similar, similar question. Um, do we think there is enough being done in our cities that are expanding at the moment? I mean come from a lot of wonderful charities that focus on ecosystems that we maybe did have and declined or, or that aren't doing quite so well, but our cities are growing and that's where most of our population is and will be, that maybe there's sort of a, a gap where we need to be thinking or have some new charities about city trusts where, where, the, where we can get wildlife where there isn't wildlife. I'm not going to let Craig. Well, let, let's wait and see. Let's find out what Craig's answer to this question. Let's go to Becky, because a lot of the work that you do, a lot of your members are, are urban dwellers, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, I think, I think it's a really good question, and I think it's really, really kind of salient for now as well. I think, um, it, I mean, certainly when I was at the Woodland Trust, you know, trees, trees in cities were becoming a massive issue, and, you know, um, I was kind of there at the time of the kind of Sheffield street trees battle and you know and we've got similar things playing out in other cities still we don't Plymouth, have learned yeah. that lesson Plymouth yeah exactly so you know that that is kind of one obvious example of where the way in which we design our cities and the way in which we kind of um uh, are able to use them as people could be so much better than it is now I mean our cities could be much much better places to live I think than they are now if we were able to incorporate kind of wildlife and and the right kind of habitats in our cities as part of how we live and I think um, it's it's so interesting when you look at kind of um, how people I, I'm lucky I live I live in the middle of a city I live in the middle of Nottingham um, and uh, but the area where I live has got street trees it has got really really good wildlife there are some protected allotments kind of just over the hill so it's not unusual for me to see kind of buzzards in the air above my garden you know so I I think it can really really work but it needs it needs the value of what those spaces bring to be brought into the kind of um, evaluation that councils in particular are doing about what it's what is of value and if it's only about kind of a financial return then you never incorporate the full value of the kind of um, uh, the kind of services, I suppose, that that can bring to us, as well as the you know, huge wildlife benefits as well. I mean, um, yeah, I've noticed something in Camden yeah. where there's been a lot of redevelopment of estates. Um, I know this is very parochial, but it's relevant. <laughs> and they've taken the sort of 60s and 70s estates and rebuilt them because the build quality was very poor. But you notice the footprint of the new buildings seems to be much more extensive than the old ones. So the areas of open land that they used to have vanish and I wonder that seems to be a pattern yeah. of new developments that they're much more dense and, and think, things like surface flooding cooling these are all issues that our cities are dealing with now as a result of climate change and just having more nature in our cities could really help us deal with those you can um, bring down temperatures quite dramatically yeah, yeah. with more trees but let me bring up a positive point about cities so urbanization yes. is a huge international trend um, with the concentration of people in cities, there's huge benefits actually for communities living in cities. They tend to be more productive and more innovative and more inventive and all sorts of other things. That, I mean, that potentially is good news for wildlife, isn't it? I mean, you could see, for example, in places like Spain, which have essentially had a later agrarian revolution, mm. you've seen great, and France, you've seen lots of people leave the countryside. I mean, I've got a friend who's really keen on Spanish uh, friend who's there's wolf populations in southern Spain that have 
used to be there, you know, a thousand years ago, that have come back to deserted villages. Um, is there a positive story in urbanisation, taking people out, you know, taking the pressure off the wild spaces by moving people to cities where perhaps they're better off? So, yeah, this is this is a really complex uh, sort of topic to discuss. So, certainly, that's a trend you see across Europe. You see staggering wildlife come back. Um, populations of bison, bear, wolf, lynx, the lot, all recovering um, a, a, across Europe, which is a, on one level, um, so really with positive with urbanisation or is that, I mean... Uh, it, yeah, because it's linked to land abandonment, and, and which has been a long-standing issue at, at a European that's, level. that's natural rewilding, isn't it? Well, that's what they've been doing, yeah. yeah. They've been rewilding themselves, right? Yeah. I mean, but that's, the, the... But that's good life. news, I and mean, that's what I'm trying to get at. You seem... It is good news. No, but I think it's not... I don't think the answer is therefore get everyone out of the countryside, which seems to be a an underlying a theme of mine. that you <laughs> might be uh, saying there. It's living better with wildlife. Um, you have an equal risk that people come, become increasingly detached from nature in urban contexts and start to lose an understanding of what it was to live with that wildlife and therefore value it. Because you, you can value things even though you come into conflict with them. I think we have a, a simplistic notion of, of people who just love wildlife forever. I mean, it's, you have an ever-changing relationship with it, but with that comes deep respect and understanding. And that's often where indigenous communities are. They don't just love it. They're having to live with to tooth, was it tooth and jowl or whatever, tooth and claw. So the good and the bad. And, and we lose that instinctive respect and, and understanding if, if um, we are completely detached from it. So coming back to the question around the importance of urban um, diversity and we have to do more. We have to show urban spaces can be uh, wilder, more diverse, more abundant with wildlife. And we have to fight the, the battle that says that we don't like scruffy and we need tidy urban spaces. We need to stop having just flat green parks. But that is happening as well. I mean, this is another point. And, and this is the point, right? This is, and it is happening. And, and you see it in parks across the country. You're that thinking. they leave the grass for longer, they let the ground nesting birds... I mean, We need to think about all of our green spaces, all of our canal and road verges, all of our graveyards and cemeteries everywhere. Think about them as connected landscapes within an urban context and that's going to allow wildlife in and to move through uh, those places. Come on, now we can hear. Is he going to give the same answer? Come on. I, I really don't know whether I'm going to give the same answer. I'm struggling <laughs> to remember what it was, but anyway. Um, look, what I would say is I think we're more attuned to this now than we've, we've ever been. And because... You, when you say we, do you mean the British population? Or uh, actually, a lot of people around the no, world. And, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, but, but so I just want to jump in there, because that shows a connectedness, sorry, Greg, to nature, that you can be an urbanised society and have yeah, that what, sense of longing and pre in value, valuing of nature. Sorry, well, I'm go. talking specifically as a result of the lockdowns that happened during oh, COVID. Yeah, yeah. So there was very clear evidence that in 2020, here and also around the world, for people living in big towns or cities, you know, suddenly uh, they were yearning for their daily dose of nature. And we saw at the Wildlife Trust, I mean, we have, we have uh, more nature reserves than McDonald's has got restaurants in this country. In fact, a thousand more. And 60% 60, 60 <laughs> of the... Becky's heard me say it a million times. Sorry, Becky. Um, <laughs> but 60% um, uh, of the British population live within uh, three miles of one of our reserves. And so, you know, for us, local nature is really mm. important, really important. And actually what people realised during lockdowns is just how important, not just how important nature was, but how important local nature was, nature on their doorstep. We saw a 2,000% increase in April 2020 of the people looking at the webcams from our nature reserves. As people were struck, maybe they had more time on their hands, but also people striving for that connection to nature. And even our Wildlife Trust members uh, would suddenly discover Wildlife Trust Reserve on their doorstep that they didn't previously know was there, as people did that. And I think a lot of that has kind of stayed, actually, in, in, to a greater or lesser extent. It's absolutely extraordinary how people feel that need for nature on their doorstep now. And why is that, actually? I think what we're starting to realise is just how incredibly important nature is for our physical and mental well-being. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you, you know, these studies that are really well proven now over the last 40, 50 years, that people recovering from an operation in hospital recover faster if they've got a view of nature from the hospital window than if they don't. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's deeply ingrained within us. And so ultimately making sure that we have good, thriving, high quality nature 
in and around our towns and cities is really important for humanity as well as for nature. Yes, we've got to put nature in recovery over the decades ahead. That's absolutely crucial to tackle the ecological crisis. But we've also got to put the relationship between people and nature into recovery. Otherwise, humanity's in a mess. Excellent. Was that the same answer? <laughs> yes, yeah. Tell me later. What, what yeah. I said yeah. um, I'm going to. I, I know. I know. We've got a couple of questions here, but I've also know there's an audience online, and we've got to give them the opportunity. Right at the back there in the shadows. There's a couple of questions from online. One has come from Leeds from Zulfi asking, "What is the most creative way you have encountered of generating public engagement with biodiversity?" And oh, no, no, just can I just question. ask two? No. And, I'll come back to you for the second one, but you know, because it's so confusing, you have to remember two questions. Uh, Zoological Society of London, you know, what is the, what, what do you think? So I think it, it's, again, I mean, we come right back to the introduction and, and maybe being in the British Library, it's combining art and, 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 the, um, and the science of nature recovery. So I've seen wonderful kind of, well, pieces of visual art, sculptural art, performance art, where people can um, bring a completely different perspective, a completely different audience with them to talk about really heavy issues and, and, and engender a sense of hope. And actually, when you work internationally, you see that happening at a community level. When you're standing in a community singing with uh, people around the, the importance of, of those habitats, it's, it's an incredibly moving uh, experience. And I think those combinations of not, not appealing to the head, not going after the science facts that you got me to say at the beginning, that yeah. you know, it's all buggered by 69%, um, but actually going to the heart, and that's where we will see change. So I think that's the one. Jen, you want to pick up on that? I think, because oh, yeah. I actually interpreted the question slightly differently, thinking... Oh, do you? Yeah, kind of more imaginative oh, approaches. Yeah. It could mm. be either. Yeah, I think, I mean, sometimes... Have you got any really imaginative... <laughs> you know, I, think sometimes, I think sometimes, actually, the simplest things are almost the best in terms of kind of really kind of allowing people to get that emotional engagement. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know I, one of the things I did really early on when I went to work for the RSPB was people took me to um, Snettisham, which is kind of um, on the boundaries of the wash, and, um, and if you go there at, um, at dawn, when the pink-footed geese are all out on the wash, and they all, as dawn, as dawn breaks, they all kind of rise up off the wash and they kind of whoosh over your head as they kind of go inland um, to graze. And it's the most amazing, amazing kind of encounter with kind of really very emotional, you know, people cry and it's all very, and I, I remember, gosh, I remember the first time I saw an elephant, I cried, but when you see the pink-footed geese, you really have an emotional response to it. And I think it's ways of engendering that emotional response, that yeah. I think are often the best kind of creative um, initiatives. But the other, the other thing I would say is that I think there is a kind of, um, a bit of a kind of, sort of creative upwelling, the kind of stuff you were talking about. It's almost like, um, it's almost like we're in a kind of a bit of a, a eulogy situation where people suddenly are realising what is at stake and what we are starting to lose. And you get this sort of upwelling of kind of writing, you know, um, there's lots and lots of nature writing now. Yeah. There's kind of lots of music being composed. It's really interesting that that is the way we respond is through kind of really imaginative and creative responses in into the loss that we're starting to kind of sense around us. So... Um, I think, but I do think the simple things are often the things that really engage people's emotions. Yeah, well, to build on that, I think the thing that came to mind when you asked the question, Justin, is that... Um, I didn't... It was not, uh, Le the woman oh, in Leeds. Who absolutely, was. of course, someone in Leeds. Um, when I was at uh, uh, Friends of the Earth, uh, directing policy and campaigns there uh, about 11 years ago, and we launched the, our campaign on bees, uh, actually, we launched it by... Uh, so inviting people to get free wildflower seeds, packs of wildflower seeds that we'd send in the post. And of course, the thinking behind it was not that somehow this was going to lead to so much creation of habitat that bees would be saved, um, but it was to give people a sense of agency. Mm. And much as when we're talking about the need for big system level change, and so, mm. actually it starts by giving people a sense of agency. And we knew that if the one of the first things we did was ask people to write to their MP or something, actually you'd get, you'd get the Keeney Greenies doing it, maybe 10,000 people or something. 
but we needed to reach out into sort of mainstream Britain, as it were, and try and mobilise many more people and give people a stake in this campaign. And I think, I seem to remember rightly, it was like we sent out some like 150,000 packs of wildflower seeds to people. And goodness knows what happened, probably some of them are still in drawers, some, some of them are planted, whatever. But when people got those and they planted them with their family, they aligned themselves to the cause of the campaign. And then they were much more likely to take the actions that we asked after. And we actually ended up getting like over 100,000 people writing letters to their MPs on it. And it really worked. And it, and it just is, you, we've got to kind of realise that people, people have to be given that sense of agency, that sense of being able to bring about change. You've got to build up to it slowly, but then it can be enormously powerful when you do it. Um, let's, because you, you had a question, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, so let's go to you and then we'll go back to that and then we're going to come to you. Right. Yes, my question's actually kind of links a few together and it, it kind of starts where you spoke before, Andrew, around almost I wanted to make a distinction between responses as a consumer versus as a citizen because mm -hmm. I feel like they're quite distinct and so we've talked a lot about the feeling of the momentum of being connected to nature and feeling as though um, people are starting to realise what's at stake yet there still does seem to be quite a big gap between our capacity to respond or that action and the ability to have a form of action as a consumer versus as a citizen. And sometimes we've even seen statistics where if we're putting a bit more money towards something as a consumer, we're tapping our card for a few more P towards a certain cause, we're more, less likely to actually make other tangible actions um, that are also um, environmentally conscious. So what I would love to explore is your thoughts on some tangible actions, actually, as consumers and as citizens that you've seen or think about ways that we can engage people. Because again, as citizens, it's usually political response. And as you just said before, actually a lot of people don't really feel that engaged writing to the MP or feeling like they can, even though that potentially has some significant leverage in a way that buying bamboo something rather isn't. So I'd love just to get your thoughts on your role in the trajectory of wildlife conservation where you see the most effective points of action from a citizen perspective and a consumer perspective. On that, I mean, your seeds were quite a good example of that. Yeah, I, I mean, what I would say is for the whole of my career, I've had people asking me, oh, but what can I do? And, you know, we used to say, oh, well, it's this petition that week or it's that petition that week or whatever. And I've, I've come to decide, actually, that's the kind of wrong answer because actually it's not for me to tell you what the best thing is to do. The, for each individual, the answer will be different. And so, you know, if you're a teacher... The, what, the question is, what's the most effective difference you can make? And if you're a teacher, or if you're a farmer, or if you're um, a, a politician, or if you're the boss of an oil company, those will be different answers. So it's for each of us to kind of figure out what's the, what's the truly remarkable, you know, what's my way that I can make the biggest difference in my world with my agency and my connections and the ability that I have, or it, it might be in your local community and building a community group that then can be part of something bigger. Um, and so I think, you know, there's sometimes the, you ask what's the most in, impressive things that I've seen, it's always the ones that have been organised by individuals and communities. Actually, very often without the help of big NGOs, funny enough, it's, it's the, the really exciting thing is action at the grassroots that can surprise and bring about real impact and politicians find it actually very hard to ignore activity that is authentically done by grassroots communities. Yeah, I, I would completely concur with that. Christiana Rodriguez, um, uh, who, um, who uh, talks a lot about climate, always says step into your agency. So find your agency yeah. and mm. step into it. And I think that's really absolutely right about this as well. I mean, the other thing I was going to share was this, um, uh, we've just been involved in something called the People's Plan for Nature. Um, which was um, an exercise around taking um, you know, 100 kind of representative people and actually getting them to kind of hear the evidence around what's going on in terms of nature loss and come up with a plan for what should happen. And that plan is really, it's magnificent. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, look at it online. It's just great. And, um, and I, had, I was lucky enough to talk to some of the people who'd been in that assembly. And you know, many of them had started from a point of kind of, well, I think, I think we were paying them a hundred quid to take part or something. I thought, well, four weekends, hundred quid, yeah, I'll do it. And actually they've come out at the other end of it 
feeling very impassioned about what needs to happen and the role they can play in it. And I think that that role for many of them has been just about really wrapping their heads around it all and kind of taking that evidence on board, becoming a bit more citizen rather than kind of consumer and kind of shifting the dial for them towards the citizen end of that kind of continuum and wanting to kind of step up and, and, and they're, they're really keen to kind of take it forward as well. And that's been a really interesting kind of journey to kind of be with them on. Um, and they completely own that plan. You know, they, that's their plan. Um, and I think it's going to have a powerful kind of part to play as we kind of move forward towards things like a general election over the next kind of 18 months or so. Um, so I think it's just about kind of, it is about finding your agency, but it's also about kind of having the opportunity to kind of get, wrap your head around some of the complexity that we were talking about and kind of find your way through it as a citizen as much as a consumer. Do you want to, don't feel any obligation. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just a couple of things. I mean, I think one, the line between citizen and consumer is really blurred, and I think increasingly so. So you are exerting a political influence depending on some of your choices and, and as a citizen, likewise. I think don't let the topic ever slip into the parochial or the sense of, you know, oh, we're going to talk about the environment. Okay, that, well, that's a nice thing, but we've got some serious stuff over here to talk about the economy and growth. Mm. And, and always ask the question, why do we not have a sustainable growth agenda? If you want growth, what does that mean in a new economic and, and, and climate context? Don't ever let it be marginalised as a nice thing, as a thing that, that is not a serious political issue. And I think keeping the discussion front and centre, where, wherever you engage, however you engage, is vital, because otherwise it will always uh, sit in the slightly nice to have uh, capacity, and that's where we, we need it not to be. I see an opportunity for a little link to our monarchy theme that we had, which is one of actually one of Prince Charles's now King Charles's initiatives was to bring businessmen on board yeah. and have them as part of the discussion, recognizing the kind of power and potential they have, um, which I thought was was quite inventive. We've got another. I know we've got another online question. Up there? Yes, it's from John in Kilburn. What one big change in farming in the UK would do most for the most species? Oh, they're always difficult, these questions. What one big change in farming would do the most? Who wants to take that? Massively reducing pesticide use. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. Isn't um, that happening? Already? And we have a target that came out of the COP15, the Global Biodiversity Summit, in Montreal in December, um, to halve harm from pesticide use by 2030. At the moment, the UK hasn't got the first clue how to do that. It's done really very little thinking, the UK government, about how to halve harm of pesticide use by 2030. And Precious, yet, yeah. that would make a huge, huge difference. What about? Okay. I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. And I, the other thing I would say is um, I, think, I think there is. Um, we were talking about, you were talking about nature friendly um, farming and the kind of the, the sort of interest in regenerative farming and kind of which is kind of you know looking after your soils really mm. kind of um making sure that your soils are in the best possible health for your food production as well as kind of having being good for nature and i think i think there is a sort of a real interest in that area and every time i go to groundswell i think it's called something else now which is a kind of a meeting that happens in the summer every year to really kind of you know uh, look at that whole area it grows there are more and more farmers there every year who are getting really interested in this because as much as anything it's the, the, the cost kind of gains because you're not having to you know, apply really expensive fertiliser, which is really shot up in price. There are all sorts of reasons why you know, that interest in regenerative farming could be really encouraged, I think, by, you know, by the government, by kind of um, farming organisations. And I think if we could really put rocket boosters under that through kind of the subsidy schemes that we have and so on, that would make a huge difference because the benefits for both kind of having sustainable food production and for nature are great. And the other thing I would say, it's actually, it's not a farming change, but it's a, it's a food system change, yeah. which is looking at what we eat. <coughs> yeah. So it's the kind of, it's the elephant in the room that governments don't like to go near because it's kind of behaviour change and it's diet and it's all that sort of stuff. But if we really did something about what we were eating, that would have a huge impact on the food system as a whole. And it would have a huge impact on kind of farming and therefore on nature as well. So that's the other thing. So I'm going to ask you, Andrew, the really difficult question. How do you begin to make that kind of change happen? 
in in the food system. Yeah, yeah. How do you begin? To, you know, and it it is really interesting. Food is clearly a really key part of tackling you know biodiversity loss, but also climate change. And governments are really, really reluctant. And actually, I mean, I hesitate to criticise them, but the Climate Change Committee, which is good on all sorts mm -hmm. of issues, is really reluctant to be honest about how big the changes in food consumption should be if we're going to really get on top of the climate issue. I mean, they are, you know... And well, and the biodiversity issue. And this is yeah. where they're all, all paths lead to the same solutions. And I, and I think, uh, well, let's chuck health in there as well um, yeah. in terms of our sort of food consumption patterns and things like that. Um, and that's a global issue, right? So, so much of our food is being sourced globally and, and we are kept very separate from the impacts that though those choices we make as consumers in our supermarkets about what we want to eat here and now are having uh, around the world. And what we are seeing, and this is where policy and governments have a, a strong signal as well, is we're seeing much stronger influence coming in through policy to say that we need to see deforestation-free supply chains. We need to get deforestation out of the, the, the production of the foodstuffs and products that we consume and, and, and eat. And now you're, you're going to see a raft of legislation at a, a European level but it will, and, and at a UK level that really is looking at traceability and, and companies and, and uh, others are going to have to respond seriously. So again, we're back to what choices are you making as a consumer in the foods that you eat how are you maybe balancing the, the, the foods you choose to have and when you choose to have them? And how are governments um, starting to you know, apply the, the stick approach as well? And you need both of those happening together. Justin, a real tangible example of that is Becky was talking earlier about pollution in the River Wye. Mm. So the River Wye was our pristine, beautiful river in England uh, just two decades ago. Now we all know that it's just been appallingly polluted with agricultural runoff. That agricultural runoff is associated with intensive poultry units. So that's bad enough, that's tragic enough in its own right that we've lost this beautiful pristine river Y in this country and that it's causing, this, uh, causing appalling impact here. But the next bit of the story is even more tragic is that those chickens in those intensive poultry units are being fed on soil being grown in the former Amazon. And so, you know, for all for a three pound chicken, we end up not only trashing the river Y, but trashing the Amazon as well. You know, we've got to do something about that. And again, government is being pretty silent about it, to be honest. Uh, let's go to, yeah, there's two of you there. Yeah. You had a question as well, I know. I keep promising you, I'm saving as, you to do as, as someone who um, reached retirement age this year and has been involved in the hospitality industry for 35 years, where um, my brother and myself ran our own business, including a delicatessen in Leicester, which we try to focus very much on ethically soiled uh, um, source products. Um, we, since 87, we've been through what, four recessions and we've seen the ups and downs. Mm. I know we should all talk about how we source and what choices we make, but you do notice when a recession hits, mm that your production base, which is not going to be the cheapest, has a real impact in, in terms of our business. And um, as someone who kind of has grown up, my, my father worked all over the world, and for example, in the 60s, when we were living in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, it was only 440,000. It's 20 million and counting now in that city. Um, as, as my father worked in Bangladesh, and he was very instrumental in helping a leper colony that the state, okay, they'd just been through a war and didn't have many resources, but he helped a, 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 a French Catholic priest to develop a leper colony where they were kind of producing frogs, you know, basically to be flown to France to be used in high-end French restaurants. And you think, where does that go from? And I find that in my retirement, I kind of oscillate between being incredibly optimistic to being incredibly pessimistic. <laughs> and, you know, we, we have a family house in uh, Doniana, which we've done everything. It, actually, in San Luca de Barameda, the southern end of Doniana National Park, which is, I guess, probably Europe's largest wetlands and an entrepot for birds to be flying north, south, etc. And yet, you know, now UNESCO is threatening to take away its status because they're extracting even more water for strawberry growing so that we can have them 
cheap in our supermarkets in the UK. Um, so I, I, the, the point I'm trying to make is that I do find it very difficult to, I mean, I oscillate literally from one end of the spectrum to the other. And then I can read something very optimistic and I feel good about it. Then I can, I mean, you know, I mean, read a book by Aaron Doherty Do Ro uh, Roy about the destruction of a historical Aboriginal group in India where they were only interested in the mining corporations. I find that really difficult to keep all of those ideas in my head. So let's, I mean, let's very briefly, uh, you know, optimism or pessimism, where do you stand? I mean, you've already said that you, you, you have to be optimistic. I mean, how do you feel? I mean, you deal with conservation the whole time, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, th you know, that's my daily life, that is. Um, that sort of oscillation between, oh, my oh, God, God, and OK, yeah. we can do this. Um, you have to maintain a, a sense of um, kind of optimism, and, and uh, it, but not mindless optimism. I, I, you become a realistic optimist, or whatever you call it, um, in, in terms of what needs, what can be achieved and what steps you can take. And, and the changes we're going to have to fight through, though, as well, as, as a human society. So it's not going to be easy. Craig, do you want to...? Well, I think it's entirely natural that you oscillate between those states because both are true. That's the point. And we have to, it's not a binary answer. And actually that makes sense because if you look at the history of big social changes that have happened, um, things like the abolition of slavery or uh, gaining LGBT rights or anything like that, guess what? We like to imagine change happens in a nice linear way. It doesn't. Mm. It happens that you get a surge of support for something in progress and then you get a pushback and another surge of support for progress and uh, then a pushback. And um, with this incredibly complicated social change that is basically working out how eight, nine billion people live on the planet fairly within environmental limits, it's going to take a bit of time to kind of get there. And, and our job as, you know, say for me, I consider myself a campaigner, any of us trying to bring about this change, it can't be to think that that change will happen in a nice linear way because it never has in human history. It's to recognise that our job is to make sure that when a wave of change is coming up the beach that supports our agenda, we push it as high as we possibly can. And when a wave is going out again against our agenda, we resist and stop it going back to where it was before. We can't stop the fact that change happens through waves. That's exactly how change happens, because that's how society learns about the need for this kind of change. Our job is to make sure each time a wave comes in, it goes higher up the beach than before, and each time it goes out, it doesn't go so far, until we reach the high watermark of learning to live fairly with environmental limits. And that's important because, to my mind, that's the next step of human progress. Do you want to... Because I've got a couple more questions, yeah. so I wouldn't mind... Yeah, let's go to you and then... Thank, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anthony Lane. I'm a journalist at the Dow Jones Newswire. Given how dependent economies and big bu and businesses are on ecosystem health and, um, and biodiversity, is there a case for compelling businesses, especially big businesses, to invest in nature projects, in biodiversity restoration, rather than just say through a voluntary biodiversity credit market, which is uh, being set up as we speak? Uh, because ultimately, if you have like a seven hundred billion dollar funding gap, annual funding gap, I mean, how can you close that gap without significant chunks of private sector money? It's a good question. Compelling yeah. businesses. What do you think? Uh, well, I think we've, funnily enough, on the back of the the Wild Isles program that I was talking about, we've got we've got some specific yeah. films for businesses, which we launched just um, about. Mm, a week ago, two yeah. weeks ago, um, and um, you know they're aimed at specific sectors really um, to kind of set out what we think the issues are and, and and what we think businesses could be doing, and and it's interesting. I think I think businesses have very much kind of, you know, um, taken to heart the kind of net zero agenda, the climate agenda, and of course they have been compelled around around some of that. Um, and I think I, my instinct is that the kind of what we call the nature positive side of that, which is the biodiversity side of that, is coming actually. And that, that kind of forward thinking businesses and investors are starting to get into that space. It's a more complicated space for them because there isn't a single kind of, you know, um, metric or target like there is for, for climate. So it's a more complicated space for them to be in. But they're certainly, they certainly get it. 
uh, and they understand that you know, um, a, a, a healthy biodiversity underpins their economic success and they can see the risks all around them as business risks which are coming down the tracks for them. Um, and I think my instinct is that, there will, that the same thing that has happened around climate will happen around that kind of nature positive agenda for business. Whether it will happen soon enough is, is another question. Um, and, and I think in terms of kind of the money coming in from the private sector to this agenda, that, that is absolutely starting to happen, I think. I mean, you, you had the example of Aviva, um, but the, there's definitely, and I think, I think the, the voluntary carbon market is a bit full of cowboys at the moment. You know, there's everyone, everyone everywhere kind of, you know, selling everything. Um, but there is, but there are, there are standards coming through around that market, and I think they will settle. I think the thing that we really absolutely need from government is much stronger kind of regulation to get that kind of, that market sorted to get us a kind of a level playing field around it. And I think that will make a real difference in how that market develops and whether it develops fast enough. So it's a bit like your kind of, I, I would not say pessimism and optimism, I would say outrage and optimism. You know, there, you know, we need to be kind of outraged by what's going on, but optimistic that I think this is starting to happen. So, I mean, on that, I, I think one of the lessons we took from, from Montreal and the global biodiversity framework was companies are moving far faster than governments. Mm. So you are seeing companies flood into this space. And at the moment, they are, because of the, it's a more complex topic, they, they're kind of going, right, we get it. Don't quite understand it. We know we've got to do something. Not sure what that is, but we're going to do it. And, and they, we're kind of, that's where we are right now. But we're seeing companies move far faster than, than, than governments are. Um, and so it's all about helping companies see, see how they can uh, influence things. And the other thing to say is, actually, there's an awful lot of money looking for a home to land in conservation, but it is stuck and it is not landing. And, and that connect between what is happening on the ground versus what is floating around looking for a place to land, that connection is not happening at the moment. Why not? Why? Why? There are all sorts of sort of, uh, you know, like cultural differences between how lots of, you know, whether it's communities or NGOs think and on timescales and how governments, uh, sorry, how corporations need to think. There's issues of scale. So uh, certain, you know, investors are going to want to put hundreds of millions of, of dollars into to projects and projects just don't know what to yeah. do with that and can't respond on the timescale that, that corporations need. So there's a lot of translation so that needs to happen between the two. But if you talk to companies and investors, it's not the lack of money. It's how do you get it to, to projects on the ground? Well, that's really positive, isn't it, Craig? It is, and I, and I uh, so I think that's absolutely right. And you know what frustrates me in, the, in this debate is the lack of willingness of governments to regulate, really, because they, they often assume that business is anti-regulation, but that's not been right. my experience at all on this. We've seen it on the climate debate, is that, you know, in the end, it took companies coming out about 10, 15 years ago, almost pleading for governments to regulate and to set the long-term policy frameworks mm. in place to enable them to scale up their investments in low-carbon technologies, you know, because they need the confidence to be able to do that. They need to know that's way, which way we're going, then we'll get on and do with it, deal with it. And I think we're at the same, similar kind of place now where increasingly a lot of the leading players in the corporate sector are saying, you know, for example, the, the offsets for business, it's a wild west and we can't make sense of it, but actually if governments would blim and regulate and set the policy frameworks, then those hundreds of millions and perhaps billions of dollars will follow. So we need to see those tram rails being set by government and then business will, will know what to do. But unfortunately, uh, all too often businesses, are, uh, governments are scared to regulate because for ideological reasons. We've almost come to the end, but if you had a question, you're welcome to chuck it in now. I, I will. Uh, so so I just want to say first as a scientist and somebody involved with both ZSL and the library, I think it's fantastic that the library's had this exhibition on science and animals and con I think it's brilliant and I think everybody should go to it. That's the, the second thing is is a real question, which is we've heard about the ways in which everything is connected with everything else. So biodiversity, climate change, human activities, human beings interacting with nature, coexisting, interdigitating, I think was a word we heard. It's immensely complicated. And I'm wondering whether 
you are comfortable with the kind of models that must be being used to predict the outcomes of any changes, whether it's on a micro scale or on a macro scale? And is there more space in this area for modelers, for actually people like who are working here in the Alan Turing Institute to help out to, to decide what it is we should do first, what's most urgent? Because I because what I'm hearing is, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this, but you have to prioritise. Got to keep this quite short. Does anybody want to pick up immediately from that? Anybody? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, this is a space for uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, and this is where we're going to see some really exciting collaborations push uh, science and prioritisation forward. And a lot of that is actually also happening. So um, there's a real you know, science of decision making and, and prioritization out there in, in terms of what is the best bang for buck. And Becky and Craig, do you feel you know what the priorities are? Do you feel you know what you need to do? Well, just on the modeling. Yeah, point, yeah, that's one kind I mean, of I, mean I, I, I think modeling played a huge role and continues to play a huge role in getting the climate agenda kind of taken seriously and kind of prioritized, et cetera. But again, it's a simpler model. It, it is, yeah. it is. But I, so I think, but my instinct is that modeling could have, you know, is doing and could have a huge kind of role to play in getting uh, the nature um, crisis kind of tackled successfully. Um, I think, I mean, we always talk a lot about theories of change, you know, and how you look at theories of change. And I think the thing that has really changed in how we look at that over the last sort of, you know, um, couple of decades has been that systemic approach. You know, that really wasn't around in conservation for a long, long time. And so that has really changed. I think where the modelling can help is looking at that systemic approach and saying which bits of the system would make most difference if we tackled them in, you know, in priority order. And I think that's where it could really play a huge role and is starting to. I'd say undoubtedly there's a role for uh, uh, lots of modelling to help guide the way here. But what I, would, what I would say is we don't want to wait to get the perfect answer before we start doing, doing <laughs> this stuff. Because actually, it doesn't matter how good the model will be, it will, often, it will only be an estimation. And actually, the best thing we can do is learn by doing. And so what is important is as we try different approaches, we're really good and systematic at gathering evidence as we do those to really be able to understand what works and what doesn't and feed that back into the models and ever improve them. And on that note, we do have to end. We've run out of time. I hope, like me, you agree this has been surprisingly optimistic. We started on a really down note there, mapping out the scale of the crisis, which we have to do. You have to de <laughs> define your subject. And then hopefully you agree that we've actually come, you talked about the, the you know, switching between optimism and pessimism, quite optimistic. And I thought one of the really key things, that idea of finding your own agency and where you can be most effective, looking at what you're interested in, partly, and doing the things that you care about, that being a really good way to tackle this problem, which I get also all the time, what can you do? And that's a really good answer to that question. So I think it's been really helpful. I hope you've all enjoyed it here. We've got a small but wonderful audience here at the British Library. And for everybody watching at home, I hope you've enjoyed it. And this stays online, so you can go back and refer to it, I think, for, I don't know how long, but quite a long time. John, how long? Oh, oh well, yeah, so, <laughs> so a long time. And thank you very much indeed for being here. And can you please thank our three panellists? <laughs>